indeed be a million dollar night under the Friday night lights at Rogers Center as the Calgary Stampeders clash with the Toronto Argonauts. It's a blustery night outside, so the roof is closed here at Rogers Center. Well, and on the top of the marquee is two great returners in Chad Owens of the Toronto Argonauts, who leads the league in all-purpose yards, poised for 3,000 this season, which would be make him the only player in CFL history to do it in back-to-back -back years. And on the other sideline, the Calgary Stampeders have a return threat of their own coming off a long missed return field goal for a touchdown last week in B.C. Larry Taylor is making ground on Chad Owens as this season goes on. Well, John Huffnagel's team lost a thriller in B.C., now in a three-way tie for first place in the West. And one of the reasons they're tied, they lost to the Argos in the season opening game back on Canada Day and for Jim Barker's crew now playing for jobs and wanting to play the spoiler role here in the final four weeks. Yeah, there's no question it's an important game for the Calgary Stampeders because of the head-to-head -head matchups with BC and Edmonton. Stampeders can't match, match wins with them down the stretch. They have to win outright. So Rennie Paredes kicks it off, and it will be Chad Owens from his 15-yard line. Chad Cackert's in the game looking to make a block, and Owens out across the 35-yard line before he's brought down by Robert McCune back in the Stampeder lineup. Stephen Giles, starting quarterback for the Toronto Argonauts, will have both Corey Boyd and Chad Cackard in the backfield. Boyd was very vocal on Twitter again this week, wants the ball more, and surprise, surprise, Cackard got half the reps in practice this week at the tailback spot. Jermaine Copeland poised to move into that 10,000-yard club. Could do it here tonight with a big game, and Dominic Picard, one of just two offensive linemen to play all 14 for Toronto. Boyd set up a tight end, then moved back into the backfield, and the first carry of the game stacked up quickly by this Calgary defense that's number two against the run and pass. And it's a defense that has some injury issues of their own to deal with. They do get Robert McCune back, but he's going to play for Charleston Hughes, who's not in the lineup tonight. The guys played very well over the last couple of games. And Johnny Dixon in the linebacking core. He plays for Brandon Isaac, who was Nick, couldn't practice. And Brandon Smith, possibly the nominee for Outstanding Defensive Player of the Year for the Calgary Stampeders, the way he's playing. Second down, man to man, over the backfield. Jim Johnson in his 200th game. Darren Stone is right there defensively. He takes over for Malik Jackson. And the Argos are two and out on their first possession here tonight. And big tackle in the open field there by Darren Stone. He, he had a big game last week versus BC in that loss. Last play of the game loss for Calgary. He made a nice tackle there to force the quick two and out in the first series for Toronto. There is Larry Taylor, as you mentioned, uh, Huge game at BC Play Stadium. 275 all-purpose yards. 270 in the return game. Pressure on the first punt, but Prefontaine with a good boot. And Larry Taylor back at his 13. Runs out of room along the sidelines with Brian Crawford, the special teams captain there for the Argos. So Henry Burris on a stretch of four consecutive games where he has passed for under 200 yards. That's the longest of his career. You know, the last two, his completion percentage has been outstanding at 79%, but you're right, back-to-back -back games under 200. He won't have Kenyon Rambo in the lineup. Didn't last week. It's going to be Landon Talley. who had a big play against the BC Lions. John Gott's going to move in for a guard for Steve Middleton. Tim O'Neill will play center. Starting lineup brought to you by Rona, proud sponsor of the CFL, and it's eight teams, a quick hitter. And there's Nick Lewis closing in on becoming one of the top 25 receivers in CFL history. Gets nine there, so he's only a short catch away now, two yards. Take a look at that Toronto defense. Up front, Ricky Foley, the only defensive lineman in the league in the top 10 in tackles, leads the team with 63. And then you look into the linebacking core, there's Jiro Kowali's back in the lineup, did not play, was a late scratch last week. And then in the secondary, maybe their best player on defense all year long, and certainly over the last four or five, has been Lynn J. Shell. Now Bradbury surveying the measurement, and it's just short, so it's second and 
inches for John Huffnagel's crew. And I think I mentioned Ricky fully led the team. He, he leads defensive linemen is in the top 10. Lynn J. Shell leads the team with 75 tackles. Number three in the league, yes. Lynn J. Shell. And as you mentioned, the top defensive lineman in terms of tackles is Ricky Foley. Drew Tate plunging ahead. And Calgary gets the initial first down of this game. Last week in BC, despite the fact it felt like a shootout, the Stampeders with only 278 net yards job, in the game. Man. In fact, the Argos had more yards offensively in Montreal last week than the Henry Burris-led Stampeders. Well, you know, they matched BC in first downs. Both had 19 first downs, but the Calgary Stampeders offensively are kicking themselves because they didn't get one more. And they, they gave the Lions the ball back and McCallum a chance to win that game, and Henry Burris talked about it all week. They kill the clock there, it's over. Here's John Corner's first run, it's a good one. Slashing through the secondary, it's still going into the open field, and now it's a foot race, and they're gonna catch him from behind. Byron Parker saves the touchdown, but John Cornish all the way down inside the Argo 20. That's a 57-yard run. Nice pull by John God here, and Cornish is just gonna take it in the backfield. Be patient with it once he gets up the field there. He goes right behind the block of John God, who does a nice job of cutting the legs out of the Argonaut defender, and then it's a foot race for John Cornish. Well, another reason why he has displaced Joffrey Reynolds. Now inside, LaMarcus Coker kicks it to the outside. And inside the 10, and finally knocked out of bounds around the five-yard line. So Calgary chewing up yardage on the ground on their opening possession of the night. Well, Marcus Coker has played sparingly for Calgary. He started at a nice big play, 75 yards in the game in Moncton. And a nice bounce here to get outside. At the Once again, the Argo tackle is sort of just diving for him. Good blocking up front so far for the Calgary offensive line. Argos last against the run on the season. By the way, the Cornish run of 57, his longest of the year. First and goal. Short drop for us in the end zone once Robbie Bryant. It's incomplete. I know Calgary fans are going to say, okay, hang on a second. John Cornish rips off a big run. Lamar Lamarcus Coker gets you right down to the doorstep, and then you throw it. <laughs> But you do have to keep that mix in the offense. That's why Henry Burris took a shot. Dave Dickinson called for that shot down the field to Robbie Bryant. Ricky Foley shaken up, took a knee, and now slowly walking to the Argo bench. There's Foley. So Alex Busby has checked in on that defensive line for the Argos as Calgary looks at second and goal from the four-yard line. And a passing set here as well. But they do give it to Cornish, and this time, nowhere to go. John Cornish gets dropped for a loss. And Busby at the bottom of the pile. Almost like the Argo D line there anticipated the snap count because they came out of their stances in a hurry and really reestablished the line. Didn't give John Cornish really any room. Wally, the guy who steps up in the pocket, but that defensive line set the tone on that play. So the Argo defense holds and Paredes on for the chip shot. Randy Paredes provides the opening points of the game. Calgary leading by a field goal. To win this game, we must stop their run. To win this game, we must contain their quarterback and pressure that quarterback. Okay? To win this game, we must have great kicking and great kick coverage. To win this game, we must be alert on every special team's play for a fake or a reverse. To win this game, we need 42 men playing with great effort for 60 minutes. Win the game, baby. Yeah. Head coach is fired up. Well, he knows the importance of this game. And when a team has won one of their last four, two of their last six, 
at a time when he wants the team to be playing its best and as as we mentioned off the top cannot match wins with BC and Edmonton they have to win out or not win out the rest of the year but they have to win in the standings and points they might have to yeah you're right yeah and this being described as that trap game because the Argos always seem to give Calgary trouble they won the last two meetings five and five over the last ten Chad Owens contained there by Eric Fraser the Burnaby product downfield in a hurry to limit the damage by Chad Owens well it's a different story here for the Toronto Argonauts tonight you know you know the importance of the game for Calgary they can't look past Toronto but the importance for them is to try and just sort of establish exactly what they're going to have over the next four weeks and which players are coming back to training camp which players aren't uh, talking to a lot of the people in the organization just before the game up here in the press box they were saying this film's going to be an interesting one because if anyone quits they won't be invited back Giles holding down, now drops it underneath for Chad Owens. Up the sidelines, they're going to mark him out around the 33. So that's close to nine for Owens on his 56 catch of the season. I will say this, you know, whether you're a professional athlete with a terrible record or a great one, you take two guys in a backgammon board and go out in a parking lot and they'll compete. I promise you that. So you're going to see the effort from guys like Chad Owens and the Toronto Argonauts doesn't matter what the number is in the standings. They're going to play hard. Second and short. Corey Boyd, the handoff. And he's got a first down across the 35. Yeah, how do you handle what happened and what has happened with Corey Boyd over the last couple of weeks? I mean, limited carries, I think just seven last week, and was again not happy, made a couple of Twitter remarks about it and I you know I've said for years that anytime you do that as a player in a team sport like football bring attention to yourself and that's a selfish move but in a lot of ways Corey Boyd is right he needs to see the ball more averaging three carries less so far this year Jim Barker said there were 23 plays called to him last week they try and stretch it out here looking for Spencer Watts the incomplete and stride for stride was a guy having an outstanding year, Brandon Smith, defensive halfback. You know, and this one, though, is on, on Spencer Watt. As Stephen Giles gave him a chance, and this is part of the evaluation here. As Watt's right here, and as he comes down the field here, Chris, he's got to make that adjustment outside and widen to that football a lot sooner than he did. He runs the seam. Now, he's, he checked. He finds the ball here and then takes three or four more steps before reacting to it. Second and ten. Here comes Morley on the safety blitz, and Giles will pull it down and take off. And Stephen Giles gets close to the 45 in the first down. Giles has run the football very effectively mm -hmm. in his first five starts, averaging over 60 yards per game. Yeah, 63.4. We know he can do that. 317 yards total rushing from Stephen Giles in five games I and mean, we know he can run like this a great athlete with a strong arm the question for Stephen Giles the question for Argo fans with Stephen Giles is can he run the passing game in the CFL he's yet to answer that question yet if you projected his rushing total over an 18 game season it would be 1141 which would be a new CFL record Short yardage man in a quarterback to plunge on third down and give Stephen Giles a fresh set of downs. The Argos, though, have not scored an offensive touchdown in 10 quarters. Yeah, and that's where Stephen Giles has to start to try and push the ball. I mean, Jermaine Copeland said yesterday when asked a bunch about whether or not this would be his last season, things like that, he said absolutely not. He feels great. Well, if Jermaine Copeland feels great, they need to push the ball to Jermaine Copeland a few times down the field and see if he can make those great plays he's made throughout his career. Now Bradbury's group has a conference here before the next play. Jermaine Copeland, the former Stampeder, comes into the game 89 yards short of 10,000 in the CFL. That would be the 14th player in Canadian Football League history to reach that coveted milestone. And he's wide-eyed about the possibility. <laughs> well, you know, when you have a guy that is close to 10,000, like Jermaine Copeland, 
you know you have to give him some chances and what I mean by that is sometimes Copeland's going to be covered especially at this stage in his career he's going to have guys on him it, he doesn't separate from DBs like he used to but he has always had a great knack for winning the ball when it arrives I mean whether he's well covered or not he'll out jump he'll out position himself he'll get in his position to make that catch and make that play but he can't make it on the previous play illegal formation Toronto Number 66 had come in to report as an eligible, but he was not listed on the card. Five-yard penalty will repeat third down. Wow. Jonathan St. Pierre uh, is the player involved. It's obviously not his part fault if he's not on the card, but that's the kind of year it's been in Toronto. And an excellent, an excellent description of the penalty by Al, Al Bradbury. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't see a flag, but the officials did get together afterwards to... Have a talk about it, and that negates an Argo first down. Yeah, it takes it off the board. That's a biggie. Prefontaine. Taylor at his 23. Argo cover team's been good this year, and they're good there. Chad Ripple leading them downfield. Greg Wilson, a Calgary product, going for... The 50-yarder and more. Stamps will swing it out, and is that a line of football? That might be a lateral. They're waving it off immediately. But if that ball is thrown behind Henry Burrs backwards, it would have been a fumble. Let's take a look where he releases this football. Stop it right there now oh, at the night he's standing here so that should be the line boy I'll tell you what that well, was they very see close. He stretched out and was still at the 19 that's a that's a challenge from the Argos sideline and not sure if he's going to win the challenge but I think it's worth throwing the flag yeah I think it is it's that close I mean this is one that and it and it was recovered by Toronto correct I believe so if it wasn't, there'd be no point the in the Argos challenge. yeah, exactly. challenging. Yeah. Backwards pass. You can read the lips of Jim Barker. That's a dangerous toss by the Stampeders. Let's see if they get away with it. Toronto is challenging the previous play of an incomplete pass. It will be reviewed. saying that it wasn't incomplete and Jim Barker's trying to challenge the fact that it wasn't incomplete that it was a fumble so let's take one more look at it again that ball is thrown behind Henry Burris well when you look now is was Burris closer to the 20 when he released the football that's really where his front foot is and look like the ball is right there it's now as it falls down this, this might be a better look so the release point, see, he's just. Now take a look as that rolls. Now that line's going to change, so that's going to. I don't know. I, th I think the Argos may have a case here. I do too. And there's Ronald Flemons quickly up with the football. You know, I. it looked like Henry Burris's foot was just in front of that 20-yard line. So that ball bounces behind the 20. His step after release was on the 19, but as you can see on the replays, closer to the 20, and Coker reaching out at the 19 to come up with the football. No question where his feet is and where the ball is. It's, it's in between that 19 and the 20, and that bounced on the 19. This is very, very close. But certainly worth a look. I think the Argos offense is already coming onto the field. I'm trying to influence it. Not that they can, but they're ready to go on offense if, if this call is made in their favor. You can always tell on the tough calls it takes a lot longer. They're looking at every every angle as many times as they can. I think that last angle was I do too. pretty definitive, wasn't it? This one right here. I do too. I mean, 
he starts when he goes into the throwing motion in front of the 20. Touched. It, the ball came forward and still bounced on the 19. It was first touched behind the 19. That was what it looks like to me. get the first turnover of the game their football when we come back the CFL on TSN is brought to you by Nissan well it's a big turnover Calgary gives it up at their 22 yard line let's see what the Argos can do with it again no offensive touchdown since the second quarter of the Winnipeg game a few weeks back. Take the Boyd and on a roll, Giles underneath. Bradwell's got it. And he is cut down on the play by the safety, Demetrius Morley. First down, Argos. A good play, and you don't you don't ever brew a first down. But again, this is a, a, a example of Stephen Giles gets this ball out a little bit quicker on the play action to Corey Boyd. And it gives Bradwell just an extra second to maybe turn up field and, and pick up big yards and maybe even score, make one guy miss. But a little late on the throw, and that allows Morley to recover. Yeah, but not a first down. I jumped the gun. They give him nine on the play, so it's second and one. Now it's Boyd outside. acceleration from Corey Boyd when he sees the goal line here. I mean, this is why this guy all season long, when he's been healthy, should be getting the football between 25 and 30 times a game. I like when you challenge me, baby. I love it. I love it. I love it. Extra points good. He said, don't call me your horse if you're not going to let me out of the stable. Off and running tonight. and the Argos have the lead. That first one in five games, and you can see how excited he is about it. A good block at the point of attack by Chris Van Zyl right here. He comes out on Junior Turner, and he allows Corey Boyd to get the corner. Now that he has the corner, it's a foot race between him and Darren Stone, and he wins it and gets there in a hurry. Great acceleration for Boyd, and that souvenir ball went into the second deck. Argos all day. Trying to let you know it's about the team. Yeah, I think that was the message there. <laughs> Had a 100-yard game against Calgary in the season opener. Two 100-yard games on the season. Here's Larry Taylor up across the 30, and now Calgary will try and bounce back off that turnover as we check in with Catherine Dolan. Well, Chris, I had a chance to speak with Henry Burris this week, and he said his message to his team is they haven't done anything yet. He called an impromptu meeting at uh, the end of practice earlier this week where he told his O-line that he said, remember last year, he said, we had the best record in the league, and where did it get us? It got us an early exit out of playoffs last year. He said in the 15 years that he has played pro football, this is the most talented team that he has ever played with. He said they have a chance to do something special this year. He said they need to execute, reduce their errors, and a Above all sacrifice, they have a chance to do something special this year, and they need to have that mentality in these final four games. Interesting meeting when you think that Henry Burris, and you know, from what I've read, has not done this very often, if ever, to to just after practice without clearing it with John Huffnagel or anything, called the team together and wanted to address the team. And, and I also understand that part of that message was that the window is closing for some of these players. 
when you look at how many on offense are on the wrong side of 30 years old. Emmy Burris is coming to that realization. The way the time is now for this team. Got a broken play. Burris in trouble, and he is dropped by Kevin Huntley. Back at the 40-yard line, a loss of close to five. A little bit of a timing issue here between Larry Taylor coming around on what looked like a bit of a reverse and Cornish here. There's Taylor on just to the right and Cornish in the backfield. Now he hits it quickly and he comes around. The play looks good, but they all kind of actually get in the same spot at about the same time. And now that mesh point is all messed up between Henry Burris, Cornish, and Larry Taylor. to go for Bryant and penalty flags fly as Robbie Bryant got jostled by the corner Sean Smalls. Well Sean Smalls knew he was in trouble that's why he does one of those penalties as a defensive back sometimes you have to take or you're or you're listening to the visiting team's fight song. Forward pass interference Toronto number 25 ball spot point of foul first down. It wasn't drastic but it did disrupt Rombie Bryant. The reason I say he had to do it is because Bryant had inside position there. And Henry Burris laid the football to the inside. All he had to do was run underneath it. And Sean Smalls knew it. He doesn't pull him down there or disrupt him. That's a touchdown. Seventh B.I. call against the Argos this year. 25-yard play. There's Taylor on the sweep. And Larry Taylor brought down at the 37-yard line. Willie Pyle, the safety with the tackle. Starts in the backfield, takes a big, long, sort of looping path as if he might come down and become a receiver. And then what he does is he breaks it off and comes underneath. Nice and well-executed play by Dave Dickinson's offense. And this has got to be a concern for Jim Barker right now as their run defense. There's opportunities here for Dave Dickinson to pick up good yardage, especially on first down with Cornish or Larry Taylor. Edge of the Stamps, number one, running the football this year. 117 per game, and Drew Tate outside on the second and short yardage and gets down to the 35 and should have a first down. And that's, that's what's, I think, most surprising about this Argonaut team. And when I look at their D-line and Kevin Huntley and Claude Rolton, who played so well at the beginning of the year. I well, mean, remember the first game, they were dominant against Calgary with three sacks between the two of them. And they really were. And, and then you add in Ronald Flemons, who's a, a veteran of six years, and then the addition of Ricky Foley, we mentioned his stats. You know, this should be a better front four. They're last against the run, giving up 130 yards per game. Orlando Steinauer, the defensive coordinator, is trying to get his, his system in place, and maybe that's taken some time since they've made the change and fired Chip Garber. But the bottom line being that this, this defense has underachieved this year. And they've surrendered 100 rushing yards in the opening 12 minutes. You saw it's third and inches. A chain link or two short of the first down. So Drew Tate and the Jumbo team will stay on the field for the Stampeders. Now, in fairness, Chris, you know, it's not just D-line that's involved with run stopping and things like that. Jim Barker will tell you when you lose Kevin Ivan and you lose Jason Pottinger for most of the year, that affects your run defense. Now the Stamps have the first down. Well, Jay Pottinger was injured in that season opening game and the next nine weeks on the disabled list. In fact, it looked like he'd probably be out for the year. A pretty remarkable comeback for Jay Pottinger, the middle linebacker. Without question, and Kevin, I've been one of the great tacklers in the league over the last decade, really. I mean, he's a guy who made those big tackles and has been not available due to injury to the Argos pretty much all season. So that does affect your run defense, without question. A shot, a good shot of Kevin Ivan on the bench. First and ten, Lamarcus Coker was in the backfield, but now has the ball in the flat. Be forced out by Jay Pottinger. We've got an Argo injury to report on so here's Catherine Dolan well Chris I just spoke with a very dejected Ricky Foley he says he pulled his hamstring in warm-up although he did go into the game when he came out they wrapped up his right thigh he said at this point it doesn't look like he's going to go back in so it looks like the Argos defense is going to have to do without the services of Ricky Foley I don't mean that Alex Busby will not 
be a rotation player in the longer. Look out, Drew Tate on second and two, nearly broke it. And they are just slicing into that Argo run defense, aren't they? Well, they are. And, you know, when you think about the change up front for the Calgary Stampeders, I mean, this is short yardage, first of all. So all the gaps should be taken care of without question. You take a look at that offensive line who lost Steve Middleton to injury. They have to move John God up there. Now, that's not, that's a veteran, so it shouldn't be that much of a drop off. But some changes up front. All this, although this offensive line is, is really coming close to where I think John Huffnagel wanted it at the beginning of the year. Stamps were stopped at the Argo field. The last time they were this deep, there's a pass that's incomplete. Intended for Jabari Arthur. Should have been caught. And, you know, that's that's a perfect look for Burris. And, and how he handles Jabari Arthur in the in the huddle here will be important because this is just a flat-out drop pass. It's the hot route. Pressure coming off the edge. Burris got to get rid of the football. He recognizes it. Everything's there except the catch. He had to throw it to the outside shoulder, and Jabari Arthur needed to know that because of where the coverage was. Ball's outside the 10-yard line. Calgary can get a first down without scoring. Second and 10. And Burris under siege, and Huntley's got him again. There is a flag down as Kevin Huntley has the sack. It would be his second of this opening quarter. Anthony Cannon and Jason Postinger. Holding. Calgary, number 63. That penalty is declined. Third down. That's John Gott. And so Kevin Hundley has a pair of sacks. He has six on the year, and three have come against Calgary. A little confusion here from the defense for the Toronto Argonauts. Here's the principals. It's Pottinger, Cannon, and Willie Pyle off the edge. They're going to show like they're all coming. The two linebackers in the interior, Cannon and Pottinger, drop out of there. Willie Pyle does come. That hesitation from the offensive line gave Kevin Huntley time to win his one-on-one -on -one battle. So there it is with the 28-yard field goal as Calgary has to settle for three once again. And it's 7-6 to six in the final minute of this opening quarter. CFL on TSN Action continues tomorrow. It's a good one. The Blue Bombers travel to Edmonton to take on the Eskimos. Live coverage, 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific on TSN and TSN Mobile TV. The, both teams with designs on first place in their respective divisions. There are some good races in both divisions. I mean, the West Division, we talked about the importance for John Hoffnagel's team here in Calgary. Three teams in that race, BC, Edmonton, and Calgary. Either one of them could finish first or third. A lot of Argo fans in Vancouver and Edmonton tonight. And there are the stretch games. How good is that? That is as good as we've seen in a long time. And the East almost as interesting. What a turnaround for the BC Lions starting 0-5 in the season. Winning their last seven straight and now have the season series on Edmonton and Calgary. Again, the Argos opting to accept the kickoff, trying to take advantage of Chad Owen's explosiveness. Owen's really tripped up on his own player, but is able to move it. Back to the 35, maybe got a half yard extra from where they would have scrimmaged after the field goal. No one in football has ever had back to back 3,000 yard seasons, all purpose. Pinball Clemens, of course, a guy who Argo fans know very well, did it twice, but not consecutive seasons. And the only thing, I'll, the only downside of it is a lot of the yards are on kick returns. And I, you know, but it's certainly a tremendous accomplishment. Flags fly as the Argos deploy two running backs here, Boyd and Cackert at the same time, but they don't get the playoff. And and I don't that's why I don't want to take anything away from this accomplishment for Chad Owens. Procedure. Toronto, number 59. Five yard penalty remains first down. That's the right guard Joe Appel. Especially in a season that has been a tough one for the Toronto Argonauts and their fans, but you can see the 1,400 kick return yards, which means they're getting scored on quite often and they're returning a lot of kickoffs. But the bottom line being that 
what they've done with Chad Owens this year to get him a lot more playing time offensively in the receiving core will, should pay off big time next year. 60 all-purpose yards tonight. So 325 away. Stephen Giles looking for Brandon Rideau, and it was almost intercepted. Jeff Tisdale on the corner had a chance for one for Calgary. First game of the season between these two teams. It was Jeff Tisdale with the only interception for the Calgary Stampeders. End of the opening quarter here at Rogers Center. And the Argos have a one-point lead. 15 minutes of football in the books. The Argos have the lead, even though Calgary's got a pretty decisive lead in the stats. Well, you can see their dominance in the run game. John Cornish, a big run early on in the first quarter, and their 111 yards is a pretty good pace for this game rushing the football. But they get to that Toronto offense. I know a lot of Argo fans have wanted to see Stephen Giles push the ball deep, and he is, and the receivers aren't coming up with the plays. In the first quarter, I put it on the receivers. And they've talked about trying to find a go-to guy in Toronto. Maurice Mann might be that guy uh, acquired this week, but not in the lineup yet. You know, time to get Maurice Mann on the lineup, even if he only knows six or seven other routes or, or a smaller play package. Time to get him out there and see what he can maybe create with Stephen Giles. I mean, this is a team that has a chance here, and it's a consolation prize, I get that, but a chance to look at some of what they have for next year and make some tough decisions on who's coming back to camp and who's not. face mask or horse collar tackled by Brandon Smith. It's a 25-yard run for Chad Cackert on his first touch. You know, Corey Boyd was hurt. He got four starts, and Cackert made the best of it when he did. His best game against the Edmonton Eskimos throughout those starts when he had over 100 yards, 139 yards rushing. A great Henry average there. Necessary roughness. Horse collar tackle. Calgary, number 28. 15 yeah. yards at the end of the play. First down. It is a horse collar, so it's a 40-yard play at the end of it. You can see the right call made as the right hand of Smith pulls him down by the neck. You know, you could see some great potential there, too. I mean, even when he played in the four starts and on that run alone, Chad Cackard in combination and in a duo way with, with Corey Boyd in the backfield, be pretty good one-two combination. Now Cackard sets up behind Giles. They give it to Boyd and... Uh, now starting to use the one-two punch as Boyd has a catch. Brought down by Tisdale at the 34-yard line. Uh, gets your linebacking core thinking defensively. You know, who, who are you going to try and focus on more? Cackard, who is a play-action man here, who just ripped off a good run, or Boyd, who started out in motion in the backfield and ended up becoming a receiver. Corey Boyd catches the ball well. Chris McCoy, the newcomer in his second game at defensive end for Calgary. Chris McCoy has one job, and he does it to perfection, and that job being contained on the quarterback and not buying in to any play action. Don't end up in here. That's wrong. Stay up the field. All your responsibility is is quarterback, and it works perfectly for him. And Stephen Giles got to get the ball out of there and not take a big, big loss like this. Boy, that's a loss of 21. Now Prefontaine will try to pin with Larry Taylor waiting. And they get the punt. A hand on the punt. It bounces downfield. And it's picked up. There'll be a no yards of five as somebody... On that Calgary special teams got their hand on the football. Al Green, the former BC line, Lion and uh, Kitchener native with a partial block. Comes right down Main Street. Splits the personal protection up front, just gets a piece of it, takes a whole bunch off what was supposed to be an angle kick. 
our CFL stats guru Steve Daniel just winced when I said partial block because officially no such thing but he got his hand on the football and it's a pretty good turnaround for Calgary after the Argos had a chance for field goal range at the 34 and Calgary ends up with the football around the same spot John Cornish up close to the 40 yard line dragged down by Claude Roten well, there's no question Dave Dickinson now will just continue to run the ball, especially on first down until the Argos stop him. You know, that's, you got your horse rolling, you just let him go. Argos have not had an answer for the ground game so far. They've given up over 100 yards now in seven consecutive games rushing. There's a fake and into the action, but he's going to get dragged down short of the first down. One thing I've noticed is to help with the run, the Toronto Argonauts are bringing Willie Pyle out of the secondary a ton. He's coming down low and playing almost even in the box right up at the line of scrimmage. This time he's just 10 yards off the ball. And I say that because if Henry Burris and John Huffnagel recognize that he does that too much, see how quickly he reacts to come up and help on the tackle. If he starts to do that too much, he's going to open up that middle. And that middle opens up in the secondary, and that's where you can make the big play behind him. Big Kevin Huntley's had a strong first half. Couple sacks and a tackle there that force the two and out. And here's Owens. And Owens runs into Randy Chevrier, gets driven back, and you can see the flag on that return. You know, I know a lot of people, and Jim Barker's one of them, who really think that, that Stephen Giles is the future of this franchise and that he comes back next year, the starting offense, a better receiving core, and he has all the tools to be able to become a real good quarterback. But this is part of the process. If you hold it there, he's in trouble Turn right about here. Toronto, number 44, illegal block. Ten-yard penalty, first down. That's Shad Cackert with the illegal block. Stephen Giles has the arm strength to just throw that into the open area. And... and the incompletion you cannot take a 21 yard loss and that's where the question marks come in about his decision making process Giles is not a rookie he's not a young guy he is six years in the Canadian Football League and this is where the uncertainty comes in with sort of anointing him the quarterback for next year I still you say you got to see it. You've got to see those decisions. You got to see the production. Throws the ball away. It's probably a four-point Argo lead. Boy, boy. See if he's feeling it. Up to the 35, and Boyd has seven. When Corey Boyd's run for 100 yards as a Toronto Argo, yeah. the Argos are seven and one. He's had two 100-yard games this year, and they're two and zero. Oh. But here's the stat that jumped out at me, Chris, when I looked at Corey Boyd's year. And I know he missed four games due to injury. They played Chad Cackert. Only 15 carries or more two times, week one and three, for Corey Boyd. Seems to be busier tonight than they give him the ball here, and he kicks it outside. And look at Corey Boyd! Down the sidelines and finally jolted out by Demetrius Morley. The horse is out of the stable. And galloping 35 yards. You know, part of what makes Corey Boyd great is that he has the power to force a defensive player to have to brace himself at the line of scrimmage for what could be big contact there. And because of his quickness now, when that defensive lineman or linebacker braces himself and stops his feet moving, he can make that bounce like he did on his touchdown run and like he did on that one right there. Because he's got the power to make you brace yourself, and when you do, he bounces it and takes advantage of that. Carl McCartney was shaken up on the play. Backup Will Linebacker. Corey Boyd with 35, his longest of the year, a 44-yard run, but the big guy's galloping in this first half. Well, and the only thing I would say to Corey Boyd is when you want to talk to the coach, do it in his office. Uh, but other than that, I'm a Corey Boyd fan. And I think that talk happened, but I think it was the coach who initiated the yes. talk this week. We may not read as much from Corey Boyd on Twitter this week coming, but you may read more about him in the... 
post-game story. Yeah, on the stat line, certainly. So that evens up the rushing. It's been a ground attack for both teams for the most part. First down. And zone read. Spencer receiver Spencer Watt well Spencer Watt comes out of the backfield and he's got someone chasing him so he can't really make a move to cut back and avoid this big big hit from Johnny Dixon that almost turned out the lights <laughs> leading by with his shoulder pads not his helmet that's a good clean hard hit by Dixon Johnny Dixon at the Sam linebacker spot for Brandon Isaac second and short and Corey Boyd will pound it down inside the 30 it's another Argo first down to the 27 this could be the Argos could be on to something that they can build on here and, and really start to plan around for next year with Chad Cackard and Corey Boyd. I think I think you know this coaching staff Jamie Elizondo the offensive coordinator is on to something here and I, and I know that this is not a surprise this is something they tried to do throughout the season. Boyd again straight ahead and down to about the 23 yard line five more for Corey Boyd Canadian ratio has something to do with that and how they can balance it and it's often difficult to have two import running backs in the backfield at once well there was the discussion do you force Maurice Mann in on a short week or they also talked about Demario Ballard giving him a look a big six foot six 219 pound receiver but instead Chad Cackert and Corey Boyd line up together for the first time this year. It's the first game for Cackert in two months. High snap, and it'll be Giles himself down inside the 20. And that should be another Argo first down. It's a little bit like what Hamilton did uh, earlier this year or the last few weeks with Terry Grant joining Marcus Thigpen and Avon Coburn in the backfield running backs for Hamilton. Yeah, I mean now and now it's Chris Jones who's who's trying to juggle his lineup and has all year. It's been a tough year for Chris Jones. He will never use it as an excuse, but he has gone through some injuries in that front seven. Losing Charleston Hughes, maybe his best defensive lineman this week, is not healthy enough to play. So Robert McCune, who's coming off knee injury, is playing in this one tonight. It's going to take him a, a bit to try and work himself into game speed. And they're starting to give up a little bit of yardage here along the ground. All inches short. Corey Boyd with 52 yards on the drive. And the Argos looking at a short yardage situation here on third down. You can pretty much go through every team, Chris, and find like a big name in their defensive front seven. I mean. Biggest name maybe for Calgary has been Charleston Hughes. P.J. Hall plunges and behind Dominic Picard and Joe Pell. That's a first down for Toronto. And Jawan Simpson missed action due to injury. He was hurt. Brandon Isaac has been nicked. Malik Jackson out with Darren Stone playing. The secondary has been pretty much intact for the Calgary Stampeders, but... Robert McCune has had to play middle linebacker for that man, Juwan Simpson. And now he's back up on the D line. So that front seven going through a lot of different personnel. Most yards, Calgary surrendered on the ground this year, 127. They're giving up 110 already. Here's Owens with the catch. And Tisdale moved up quickly to drag him down at the 13 yard line. So it's just about three for Chad Owens. Just the timing issue again. I, let me show you how Chad Owens is going to come out here. If he gets the ball right here, this is a big play. He gets it here. It's a very big difference, and it's only a couple of yards difference. Watch. Get him the ball now. Right now. He's got time. He can turn the corner. It's a touchdown. If you wait an extra second, now you allow the defense to rally. Second and seven. Looks like there might be some confusion, but Giles takes off. And that should be another Toronto first down. 
Now blitz coming off the edge and it was Demetrius Morley the free safety for the Calgary Stampeders. What they do is they move Jawan Simpson the middle linebacker back into his spot and then they're freeing up Demetrius Morley off the backside and watch how he gets there quickly and forces Stephen Giles to duck him get up and just get what he can and he's going to be close. And Stephen Giles went right to the sidelines. I think he was shaken up by that. And Dalton Bell came on. Argos getting a measurement. They will be short. Reporting. And, five nine. And, 59. and so the short yardage team comes on, and that'll give Giles a little extra time to clear the cobwebs. Took a big hit. He knew where that first down marker was. And did not even think about hook sliding. It's a good running quarterback. We know that. You mentioned that early. And again, the plunge on short yardage should be a first down for B.J. Hall. Dow's going to come back in, or looks like he's going to have to shake this off. And, and a late flag comes down just now after they unpile. And what's this all about? Argo's gesturing as if it went. It's going against Calgary. This came well after the play as they were unpiling and heading back. Objectionable conduct. Calgary, number 98. First down. That's Torrey Davis, who John Huffnagel's mentioned at times has had to uh, get his attention for losing his cool. A team that ranks seventh. Seventh worst when it comes to penalties. Bottom of the league. Almost 100 yards a game. B.J. Hall stays in, a high shotgun snap, and Hall, going to run it in, took a hit, but it's a touchdown with a flag down. B.J. Hall into the end zone. Let's see what the penalty's all about. Touchdown stands as B.J. Hall, the rookie, hits pay dirt to the Argos, expand their lead. Three-sport three athlete growing up, track, baseball, football. That shows you where that athletic ability is. B.J. Hall gets the corner. the hand but enough to get through a little play action but I want to show you the key block and again it's Chris Van Zyl who's going to get out onto Juwan Simpson the middle linebacker he's the scraper and you could see how that slows him up just enough to give BJ Hall the corner and then it's only on the edge where he gets hit 12 play drive nine Rushing plays for the Argos. Calgary's in a bit of a hole here. Larry Taylor trying to help dig him up. And he runs into Lynn J. Shell and is dropped at the 24. Only one catch so far for Nick Lewis under the weather as he arrived in Toronto for this game. Didn't practice all week long. In fact, really was trying to. John Hopnagel kept him away from the team. A lot of the guys in the Calgary Stampeder lineup are starting to pick up this flu and he's been obviously the fluids will be down and you're not going to keep Nick Lewis out of the game because he's got the flu but you wonder about where his production level will be especially in the second half. Well right now wondering about the production level of the passing offense Burris two for four 17 yards. We'll add to it here on that little check down to John Cornish. With a first down at the 35. Burris trying to change things up. I think he's going to start calling plays in the line of scrimmage, try and get a little rhythm in this offense. And and in the same time, in doing so, keep the Toronto defense in a real vanilla look, a real basic type of look. You don't want to do too many intricate defenses when you have to line up and call them on the line. Xander Robinson now on the defensive line for the Argos. There's a catch for Johnny Forzani. That's his first in three games. In fact, in his last three, one catch for five yards. So Forzani has been quiet. 
after a breakout first half of the season. Yeah, that one against BC and, and what happened? You know, that's this is a, a great question, Chris, as to what happened to Johnny Forzani. He was just on a roll, on a pace to hit a thousand yards at one point. First down, Nick Lewis in to help block, and this time John Cornish brought down quickly. There's Kevin Hundley again, and he's he starting, is yeah. dominating this first half. Yeah, he is. Uh, you know, and that's that's maybe he heard. <laughs> maybe he heard that. <laughs> He didn't like it because he when it when the Toronto Argonauts stopped the run, it's because 94 is making it happen. Going second and ten, no gain on the play. Here comes the rush, dropped off, and John Cornish cuts it back. He's got a first down four, and Cornish finally tripped by Lin Jay Show. They'll go territory. They'll mark it at the Toronto 43. Great rush average for him. He can do the same in the passing game, which is just basically a take a look at this play, a, gl a glorified run play to just swing it out to him, get him into space. Now, now if Quali makes that tackle, he's short of the first down and Calgary's kicking. 21 yard gain for Cornish. Here comes the blitz from Shell. Burris stands in and now flushed. And he's got Robbie Bryant who will step out at about the 38 yard line. So a short gain, four to five for Robbie Bryant. I mentioned Lin J. Shell early on, and, and you know when you're talking nominees for the Argos, I know it's been a tough year, but that doesn't mean that all the players have had bad years. Lin J. Shell, he came on a blitz that last play, and the timing was off a little for him. But last week, ten tackles, one sack, and a fumble recovery. He was all over the place. Seven, Burris, and that was picked off, and there he is on cue. Lin J. Shell has his second. J. Shell, 26 tackles, a sack, and now two interceptions. I believe it's Landon Talley who, if he's going to run it in, he better break it off and not banana it like that because when he doesn't make a nice hard cut, Lynn J. Shell says, thank you very much. I'll just come underneath that. Bit of a lazy route there from Landon Talley. So the fifth takeaway for Lynn J. Shell on the year. Fumble recovery and an interception against the Stampeders. Back into the hands of Corey Boyd and look out. He had 69 prior to that carry. 24 more. Argos have a first down as they give the three minute warning here in Toronto. Hamilton. I had to break the tie with uh, one final kickoff for distance and Greg Prevail. Action fake to Cackard, now going deep for Watt. He changed speeds, and Tisdale got back and made the interception. Jeff Tisdale will be taken down at the 13, and Tisdale has his third interception and his second against the Argos. Matchup down at the bottom of the line of scrimmage with Spencer Watt in bump and run coverage right here on Jeff Tisdale. And to get away from that coverage, watch how far he bends inside. Giles wants him down the rail. Because he wants to get loose, he goes way inside to get loose. Now he has to try and fight to get back there. And Jeff Tisdale, who has taken over for Brandon Browner on that corner, done a real nice job. That was a concern for Calgary at the start of the year. Jeff Tisdale has just made all those worries go away. Former Ticat haunting the Ticat rivals here in the first half. And now Burris will try and get that long out to Forzani and one hops it. Calgary's pass offense is struggling tonight. I mentioned Jeff Tisdale with an interception in the first meeting between these two teams. And Tisdale had one slip through his hands in perfect coverage. And he was replacing this man. Yes. Brandon Browner of the Seattle Seahawks who had a big play past weekend a couple weekends ago with an interception for a touchdown and everyone in Calgary concerned with Brandon Browner out of the lineup. What happened? Well, Jeff, Jeff Tisdale has filled in more than nicely. Very well. Played a great season for him. Well, second and ten looks like 
It'll be second and 15 now as they jump the gun and landed tally. Having a tough second quarter. Replacing Kenyon Rambo. Offside, Calgary, number 84. Five yard penalty remains second down. Uh, last week, Landon Talley had a 81 yarder against the BC Lions. Two catches for 94 yards and one touchdown. And you started to think that he was going to start to really step up with Kenyon Rambo nursing an Achilles tendon problem. A couple of mistakes and back to back plays here. You know, they did have 193 yards passing last week against BC, even with the 81 yarder. Struggling again tonight. Pressure on. And Nick dancing around. Anybody open? Now looking for Larry Taylor. It's intercepted. Off the corner, Byron Parker. Looking for a record. He's got it. Touchdown. His eighth interception. Touchdown return. And that ties a Canadian Football League mark. Ties him with Dick Thornton, Malcolm Frank, and Jason Goss. Touchdowns on interceptions for Byron Parker. Second interception in as many series for Calgary, and this time the Argo defense takes it into the end zone. And that football goes right in yep. the trophy case. Yep. <laughs> he's. Oh, he, no, he's going to. Is he giving that to a fan? Tell you what, that's a that's a very special football. Tying. Oh. Oh yeah. I think it's staying in the family. That's in good hands. <laughs> well done to Byron Parker. Absolutely. Henry Burris wanted Larry Taylor. He, he scrambles around to buy himself some time and Taylor who had a short rope broke it off deep there he is that ball just overthrown and Byron Parker just hanging out there he knows the record is sitting there and he, he was determined to get it you know you mentioned Malcolm Frank and Jason Goss and current fans know all about those two the other was Dick Thornton and when Dick Thornton was here Tricky Dicky was a pretty big name in Toronto at the time and uh, to be in the same record book with Dick Thornton is special for Byron Parker and the Toronto Argonauts. Oh, Assist to Ronald Flemings who blocked the most important guy in an interception and that's the quarterback. He is usually the guy that makes the tackle. Ronald Flemings got Henry Burris. Byron Parker gets his eighth touchdown off interceptions. Well we mentioned the suggestion of a trap game. And suddenly the Stampeders trail by 15. Fourteen points off turnovers on the night. Here's Larry Taylor. And again, good downfield cover. That's been an area that the Argos have not been concerned with so far this year. You know, watching Toronto last week in Montreal. First of all, Suits Friday Night Gladiator brought to you by Mavado, makers of the Mavado Series 800 watches. I was going to say, watching him in Montreal in that first half last week, you knew if they came with that kind of effort, they'd make it tough. And some of the nominees for that watch on this Friday Night Football, Van Zyl has played well on that offensive line. Corey Boyd has had a big, big first half running the football. in the game. And that's interesting. For the Stampeders as Henry Burris has been taken out to Drew Tate. Burris 6 for 11, 65 yards and two interceptions in this first half. Boundary lead because they play in everybody. In we mentioned head. under 200 yards passing in each of the last four games including a hook and now again so this is just for one series to wrap up the first half of play. Sidelines, he's got Johnny Forzani. Forzani with a big catch. 
as he beat Sean Smalls on the corner. And that may be the answer to your question yes. after that one throw as to whether or not we'll see Drew Tate in this second half for the Calgary Stampeders. And, you know, you, often this happens where Coach will put in the backup, let the other guys settle down, let the starter and Henry Burris just sit down and, and watch from the sideline and then go back. Well, after that throw, I'll be surprised at all to see Drew Tate in the second half. 42-yarder, 2-4 two Zanny. After Burris was held to 65, Tate got a roll. Nick Lewis got the catch and slices through two Argo tacklers to get the first down. Two very accurate throws back-to-back -back for Drew Tate. That long one looked like Sean Smalls on that corner. He had a chance to run underneath that and couldn't. Forzani just kept his stride. Henry Burris now watching the offense get rolling, and he's not on the field. Tate's almost matched his passing yards. In some trouble here. Screens it off. And Portis drops the football. Now, it looked like on that interception that Henry Burris may have been a little bit banged up, so this could be part of the issue here. He gets blocked pretty well by, by Ronald Flemings. Not sure if maybe he hit his head. Uh, I don't know. I think it has more to do with the interceptions than it does with that hit. Second and ten. Which is short of the first down. Nick Lewis went right over to the officials trying to argue that, that Larry Taylor was not down. Almost looked like he was tossed down and somehow stayed upright. Be worth another look here if the field goal team comes on for Calgary. Accuracy on the throws from Drew Tate's been outstanding. Just take a look at all his knees did down. Touch. He just Good call by the official. Popped up so quickly, but the right call made. And Paredes will survey another. Calgary had a couple of good drives that resulted in field goals. And now Drew Tate quickly moves them downfield for Paredes to hit another. And while Burris had 65 yards in the first half, Drew Tate had 65 passing yards on that drive. And they get three on the board and cut the lead to 21-9. So Rennie Paredes has three tonight. Remember Greg Wilson was watching Paredes and saying, okay. I think he'd take three tonight. <laughs> Pretty exciting. Of course, it only takes one for a million. <laughs> when it all started way, way back. Yes. Ryan Deesburg made it. Well, Greg's loose right now. Looks like the pressure's getting to him. <laughs> Savvy veteran. Yeah, yeah. Lance Chomick signed jersey there and got some instruction earlier tonight. Coming up at halftime, our guys will be helping coach him up. Chad Owens back at his five-yard line. Changing gears and right back up to the 35. So 52 seconds on the clock for the Argos. Enjoying a 12-point lead. And uh, Kwesi Antwi, the Burlington product, a little slow to get up for the Stampeders. There, once there's some uncertainty like that, when you see Antwi, especially on a spe uh, special teams play, the the coaching staff will actually instruct him that even if you're not sure, you know, you might be able to get up and get off the field. Even if you're not sure, though, you want to you want to just stay down, let the staff come out and get you, so that the coaching staff can then make sure they've got the right personnel on the field and everybody is filled in where they need to fill in. But you see a great ISO of what the special teams play is all about. I think it was right at the end there. Look, like Busby fell on him. So they work on the ankle of 
Antwe, who's had a terrific rookie year in the special teams category, leading the Stamps with 14 special teams tackles. The Mount Allison product is up and headed to the Calgary sidelines. That's a big boy for cover. Now, that's the type of guy you want on coverage teams. You want linebackers. You want guys around 230, 245. Antwi comes in at 250 and can run. One of four draft choices by the Stampeders in 2011 that cracked their roster. That's a perfect cover man right there. Stephen Giles, play action, think he wants Owens, and he's got him. There's the best pass play for the Argos in this first half, and it's all the way down to the Calgary 45-yard line. Yeah, he Stuck in behind coverage here. Chad Owens starts to the right of your screen. The play action to Corey Boyd really influencing that Calgary defense, including the secondary. I believe it's Keon Raymond who got caught looking at Corey Boyd and allowed Chad Owens to run free behind him. 31 yards for Owens. His longest reception of the year is 32. Argos thinking about adding to the lead. Zone read fake, and Giles is going to run it to the field goal range. Darren Stone trips him up. At the 35, see where they mark it very close to the first down at around the 34 yard line. Chris, you mentioned that Stephen Giles' pace, if, if he'd have played all, played all 18 games on his current rushing pace, which is 63.4 yards per game, he would set a record. I just, the only question I have with that is, is can a quarterback run and take hits like that, any quarterback, for 18 games? Exactly 10 on that carry. He's 4 for 29 on the night. And Corey Boyd, huge hole for Boyd. And Boyd down to the 16-yard line. They've got 21 seconds left. And a couple of shots at the end zone. Already in easy Prefontaine field goal range. Well, the Calgary front seven still on mountain time. I mean, this is a... This is a better run defense, a run defense that comes into this game ranked second in the league under 90 yards per game. They're hemorrhaging right now. Ninth 100-yard game of Corey Boyd's career, his third of the season, and his third in two years against the Stampeders. Sorry, buddy. Fake to Boyd. Complete. 12 seconds left. Time for one more. Before settling for a field goal. That means Chad Owens back on the field. Corey Boyd, I mentioned his ability to catch the ball. They can release him too. Good on those wheel routes out of the backfield. Can get the matchup on a linebacker that's favorable to the offensive team. Timeouts Time been out. called by Calgary. Calgary. And I think that's exactly what they were going to do. As they broke the huddle there, Corey Boyd bounced to the short side of the field. Well, they had Cackert and Boyd both in that offensive set. And Calgary wanted time to talk about it. Now Johnny Dixon comes in as an extra DB. It's really interesting for this this defense and this Calgary Stampeder team that you know five and two versus Toronto in their last seven, but have lost their last two games against them. One in July last year, and in the first game of the regular season this year. You mentioned that's what's a little bit puzzling about going on with this Calgary team. It will be interesting to see what the decision for John Huffnagel at quarterback in the second half, but don't be surprised at all to see Drew Tate. Well, you see, they've had trouble here at Rogers Center in recent years. Throw to Rideau. Brandon Rideau. Touchdown. at the scoreboard replay and not liking what he saw. Stunning night. Three 
Fontaine adds the extra point, and the Toronto Argonauts have a 28-9 lead. Well, this is, uh, to say this is a surprise, an understatement, it starts with play action with Corey Boyd established. The play action opens up Chad Owens to open up this series. Now, Stephen Giles takes off running. We've seen him do that throughout this first half. Another good run by 100-yard running back Corey Boyd. He gets another 100 already in this first half. And Brandon Rowe stabs this one and gets to Hader. A drive that gets the Toronto Argonauts in the end zone in under a minute. Rideau has his fourth touchdown of the year. Leads the Argos in touchdown receptions, but is kind of clinging to his job right now. With Maurice Mann brought in. Rideau's spot on the roster in some jeopardy. That will hurt. That will go a long way to helping his cause. Maurice Mann not dressed tonight, possibly next week. But, you know, I saw him go Brandon Rideau on a deep route earlier in the first half. And Feels so good to get that done. Didn't really give that full effort that you expect from receiver to fight for the football, but that last play makes up for that. He can come back and have a good second half and maybe get that coaching staff back on his side. Here's LaMarcus Coker losing his footing. So that's the end of the half. 21 second quarter points. It's a shocker at Rogers Center. Wendy's kick for a million coming up at halftime. Our goals all day. Well, the Toronto Argonauts with their biggest quarter of play this year. 21 points in the second quarter and a 28-9 lead heading to the second half with 173 yards rushing in the opening half of play. Yeah, that's what's been most remarkable. I mean, the Calgary Stampeders started out with John Corners ripping off a big run, and, and, and we thought at 117 yards rushing, which is about what they had in the first quarter, that it was going to be a Calgary running game that was going to dominate, but the Argos in the second quarter came on. 173, by the way, is more yardage along the ground than the Calgary defense has given up all year in a game, let alone the first half. And one of the key questions, who would start the second half? For the Stampeders, it looks like it is going to be Drew Tate's second half here. Critical game for the Stamps in that three-way tie. For first in the West, and with the tiebreaker against the other two teams, Larry Taylor trying to ignite something, but he has been corralled so far tonight. Wes Lysak, the former Stampeder, in on the tackle and Henry Burris it looks like maybe five consecutive starts under 200 yards passing 193 last week 158 the week before versus Saskatchewan in a win but I think it was the two interceptions for Burris that really were the difference makers and why he's standing on the bench right now one return for a touchdown by Byron Parker straight ahead and they start positively as they did the first half with success on the run and a first down for John Cornish yeah the last thing you want to do if you're Dave Dickinson right now even though you have the big deficit to overcome you don't want to break away too much from your game plan you still have to have the balance or else it's going to be pin your ears back for that Toronto defensive line Cornish has 71 so far in the game first down Drew Tate over the middle and a big hit but Landon Talley hangs on and a couple of consecutive first downs.
for the Stampeders. Well, I'll tell you what, a big hit, but I, I'm just, I've been really impressed with the end of the first half and, and the first drive and the first throw for Drew Tate and his accuracy. He didn't have a big window here. That was Landon Talley coming across. He had coverage behind him and Evan McCullough and really Powell over the top. Toss to Cornish. Down to the 45. A Kevin Hundley tackle as he continues his big night. Drew Tate has been on target. Tremendous accuracy, good zip and power. Remember, he was coming off a shoulder injury early on. Just signed an extension. You know that Drew Tate in the offseason would have had a lot of people wanting to discuss, including the Toronto Argonauts. I think it's a stretch to guess that they would be making a call. He signed back to Jack. Third year man. He's got poker out of the backfield. And he's brought down at the 39. That's going to be short of the first down. And signed back in Calgary, Chris, before he went into free agency. So he discussed it with John Huffnagel. He likes the offense. He likes the tutoring he's getting from both Dickinson and Huffnagel. And an interesting decision already here. Very early. Second half, down by 19. John Huffnagel leaving the offense on the field. Third and a full two yards. Stampeders as John Cornish not only converts, he busts it for 29. You know, one of the great things that John Cornish does when he's having so much success is he doesn't give tacklers a very big target. He gets his pad level really low. You can see how he bends at the waist so that when you try and find that number nine to line up as a tackler, you can't see it. Here it comes right away. Watch how he bends down low. You have less to hit. Over 100 in the game now. John Cornish, 7 for 102. Averaging over 14 to carry. Play action thing. Nick Lewis, touchdown! Well, that's an impressive opening drive in the second half as Calgary sends a message they're not out of the football game. Well, and Drew Tate did a little of everything there. He got the run game going again. Good accuracy on that land and tally throw over the middle to get that drive started. And then watch him thread the needle here. Play action again to Cornish. Steps out. He has Rob Cote in the flat. And look at all the Toronto defenders around Nick Lewis. Six plays, 76 hey, hey, yards. Hey, hey. It was a man. Hey, two more, two more. And Nick suffering from the flu, but has his first touchdown in five games. Stamps get a little closer. Fifty-second career touchdown for a guy who's been under the weather. His team was in the first half, but not in that first drive of the second half. I'm sure they're feeling better already, and certainly about themselves. Good accurate throw to open up the drive to land a tally over the middle from Drew Tate. Little John Cornish again, that low center of gravity. He gets himself down nice low, driving those legs, and then finish when Tate threads the needle to Nick Lewis. A real impressive drive out of the gate. Out of the air goes Respond. Paredes sends it downfield and Chad Packard on the return for the Argos and Packard sends rolling across the 35. So we've got two running backs in this game over 100 on the evening here early in the third quarter. Big numbers for both, and even though they have different passports, I like what Dwayne Ford said a couple of weeks ago about John Cornish when he said it doesn't matter what his passport says, he's just a good football player, and he's showing it tonight. And Corey Boyd's gonna add to his totals. Jawan Simpson, the middle linebacker, brings down Boyd up at the 43-yard line. You're right, Chris, you say that what does the Argos have as a response here? I mean, that's the, the question, and that's one of the reasons that this team has struggled. When they've given up a play or a drive, their offense has come out, the quick two and out, and when the quick two and out happens, now the momentum really builds for the opposition. And some cause for concern on that sideline, so Cackard in now, second and four, handoff straight ahead, and Jack Cackard doesn't want to go down. That's a first down run and a good hard run by... The other import running back in the Argos Arsenal. 
It's a little bit like a bowling ball, just kind of <laughs> rolling right off those pins and bouncing in and out of it. Gets contact pretty quickly, just about a yard off the line of scrimmage, and just keeps rolling out of there to pick up some extra yards. So two carries, 33 yards for Cackert on the evening. And with those two runs, the Argos now have their best running game of the season. They'll fake to Cackert this time. Giles strung out. And McCoy brings him down at the Argo bench. Not much there for Stephen Giles. In fact, no, he might have lost one. There really wasn't. I'm going to show you a look at what happens when you run play action to the boundary and watch how many targets up here that Giles has to look at. Go ahead and run it, guys. And as you see Giles get out there, now stop it there. See, there's only really one to throw to, and he's double covered one, two. This one's not getting there in time. So one target who's well covered and really no options for Giles. Second 11. Giles steps up. Pass batted down at the line of scrimmage. Is that Devon Claybrooks? I believe it was Claybrooks, and that'll be his third knockdown of the year. I like what Devon Claybrooks said about his team this week in the newspaper. Taking a look at the shoulder of Corey Boyd, and that's where he had that, like someone maybe hit him, bounced up. But Claybrooks in the newspaper this week said, we've got to stop being a little bit like Tarzan and Jane. I'll just drop the Jane. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a Gene first half. Well, that got by oh, Taylor. And it's going to roll inside the five. And the Argos won't mind giving up a five yard, no yards. After that, Prefontaine punt that bounces for 56. Well, you saw him at halftime, the 50 yard attempt. <laughs> It's not worth a million dollars, but $31,000 is kind of nice. And our pleasure to have Greg Wilson with us in the in the broadcast booth. Uh, what was that experience like? That was a lot of fun, I, I have to say. I, I wish I had given them the crowd a little bit more uh, a little bit more to cheer for. The 20s I usually make, yeah. but, uh, and Lance did a great job coaching me. Uh, but, you know, I, I had a ball. We were scouting and, and liked your shot at 20 or 30. Yeah, 20 and 30. Yeah. Now, now, take us through, though, what was going through your mind. Now, how much did the pressure bother you? Did you get a no. different perspective of what's going on for the guys when they have to make those kicks? Oh, yeah. The pros, oh, yeah. you know, they have guys running at you when you do that. And, and no, I can imagine. It's uh, Everybody says it's easy. It's not easy. Uh, it's, what do you do with the 31,000? Um, my wife probably gets a big, <laughs> <laughs> a big part of it. Right answer. Congrats, sir. Thanks a lot. Good answer. Appreciate it. Congratulations to Greg Wilson. If she's happy, you're happy. <laughs> Here's Drew Tate. He's got Landon Talley in instant field position for the Stampeders as they get up across the 35-yard line. And Drew Tate supplying some breathing room after that deep start. It's a 28-yard play. Oh, he's finding the holes, and Landon Talley seems to be the guy that he's looking for first. A couple big catches, one to start last series and one to start this one. Pressure this time, and the pass for Coker is incomplete. Stan Peters wanted to flag. There is one in the Argo secondary. I think this will be a pass interference. I, I, it looked to me like Willie Pyle maybe grabbed the jersey of LaMarcus Coker coming out of the backfield. And it was picked up by that deep judge. He's going to come through the formation and out this way. Now here comes Willie Pyle down low to pick him up. Pass interference. Toronto, number 10. Ten-yard penalty. Automatic first down. And I think the right call is made there, Chris. I mean, he pulled him and turned his shoulder a little bit before the ball arrived. So a start around the 10 yard line and already up close to midfield. First down Stampeders. And here's Nick Lewis. Jeremy Nerdle will toss him down, but Lewis into Toronto territory. Another first down to the Argo 51. And that's a play that we showed you. Stephen Giles ran and hung onto the ball just a split second too long. And this time it's run 
and executed perfectly by Drew Tate. Watch how he gives Nick Lewis time to turn his shoulders. One, two, three, balls out. Now and watch. He turns, and it's five, six yards before he has to go and try and run over and make a move on a tackle. That's a difference. That's giving your receiver a chance. So Nick Lewis is now number 25 all time. Here's Coker. And he has stopped inside the 45. James Murphy, a great wide out in the league, was the last man in the top 25 receiving on the all-time CFL list until tonight. And now Nick Lewis takes over that spot. Another year, and he'll get in that 10,000-yard club as well. Stan Peters looking at second and two. And play stopped and a flag down. Some movement on that Calgary line. Let's see. Procedure. Calgary, number 67. Five-yard penalty for Means. Second down. That's the right guard, Dimitri Sumpas. Drew Tate continues to move the ball like he is and continues to bring the Calgary Stampeders closer here in this game. Win or lose, it'll be an interesting week in Calgary. Will it ever? Are we seeing the changing of the guard? Mm -hmm. So second and seven. Let's see if he can convert here. Pressure's on. Steps away. Looks the other way. Yeah, that one out of bounds. Robbie Bryant, the closest man to it. And Tate taking charge has words for, is that Jabari Arthur or Johnny Furzani? It looks like. He's in the year of Jabari Arthur as he comes to the sidelines. Well, when Drew Tate finally gets out here and he actually has a chance to set up and throw, he wants any deep receiver. It's now scramble rules. And right here, stop it there, guys. So he wants deep receivers to come back. Okay, and that's what he's expecting to happen. Now, as this play continues, they start to, but not with enough urgency. And now Burke Dales looks for the corner. Owens lets it bounce, and it's going to be perfect for Burke Dales for the 15th time this year. It's inside the 10, a 47-yarder into the corner. The CFL on TSN is brought to you by Rona, proud sponsor of the Canadian Football League, and it's eight teams. I like what Drew Tate did there. This is not something you often see from a backup quarterback who's just coming in in relief. It doesn't work. He saves the loss, throws it out of bounds, and goes to take command and control. This is not an unsuccessful play. It's a successful play for Calgary because he saved the loss, allowed his punt team to get field position. But he's down there talking to his receivers, getting them back and getting them on their toes, saying, come on, if I scramble like that, you've got to come back and help me out. I, that's him taking control of that team. I like it. They flipped the field after starting at their nine and now forcing the Argos to start at their two. You can see Corey Boyd's back in after getting attention on the sidelines after the last series for Toronto. I know fans in Calgary are probably saying, wait a minute, a successful play, he threw it out of bounds. It, you know, not every play is going to be complete for a first down. And for Calgary to save the loss, good presence of mind from Drew Tate, puts his punt team on, and now look at the situation Calgary's facing. A chance to, with a stop here, get the football right back, or maybe even have the Argos give up a safety. There's a pass that is intercepted. Keon Raymond tracked it down. And Raymond on the return. Flag down. But Keon Raymond has a big interception and finally dropped is Greg Fawcett. Raymond has his fifth interception of the season. Again, a flag down, but that's during the return, and suddenly the Calgary Stampeders have all the momentum in the second half. With the intended target here for Stephen Giles was Brandon Rideau, and, and Argo fans wanted Giles to push the ball deep. He's been doing that this year. Nice interception for Keon Raymond. He'll take the gift. After the interception and on the return, illegal block, Calgary, number three. Ten-yard penalty from the point of the foul, first down. And in some ways, Chris, it, it works It works as a punt almost in the, a situation for the Argos. But I want to show you a receiver that if he's on the bubble, 
They need more out of him than this for the Argos. You just watch him gear it down right there at about the 15-yard line and then just kind of look back almost like he's jogging his route down the field. That's not good enough. I was going to say it is like a punt and the Argos don't have to make a decision on a safety. With the penalty, it's a, at the 50, a draw play to Cornish. And he'll churn for close to first down yardage once again. Boy, this has been the most impressive ground game by two teams in a game, I think, this season. Take a look at the end of this interception from Keon Raymond because somehow Greg Fassett oh. had the ball in his hands. Yep. It pops out right there, bounced right to him. The Argos almost got a big break there. They get that fumble back. Fifth interception of the year for Keon Raymond. Leads his team. Short yardage, second down. an easy first down for Drew Tate to in the first half came in on those short down situations but now he's looks like he's in for every offensive down for Calgary do have an injured Stampeder and there is some concern yeah that you can see it in Drew Tate you could see it when Stanley Bryant was waving to the sidelines to get help out having trouble picking up a number and, and so am I, but you can tell by the reaction of the players and how quickly the coaching staff or the training staff hustled out there. And uh, the guys in the truck are giving us a disclaimer here to watch at your own discretion. And is this... The right leg as Drew Tate rolled on the back. Is that G. Michael Dean who was in? It is J. Michael Dean, the rookie offensive lineman getting attention with the card out. And while they work on him, we will step out. The medical team remains on the field working on J. Michael Dean. Both teams real concerned, obviously. I watched Corey Boyd actually when he first went down. He went right over quickly and grabbed his hand. He's still staying with him right there at the bottom. They're going to have to stabilize his leg and get him on the, uh, on the truck and, and get him to the hospital. J. Michael Dean's been a very good football player for this Calgary team. He's a guy who's played both ways for him. And I haven't been able to say that about a player for a long time. He's a guy who's started on the O-line, has played a little tight end, and also played a little D-line. Out of Hinton, Alberta, but did spend some time in the Toronto area. Rookie. Out of Michigan State, 25 years of age, and... You could see the obvious concern, and yeah. uh, and that was uh, that was obvious when we showed you the replay, which we've elected not to show again. No. I stabilized it. Take him in for X-rays and take care of him in the hospital. And big man up out there in the short yardage situation for Calgary as a tight end and as you mentioned we've seen some offensive line defensive line short yardage situations mentioned earlier one of four draft choices for Calgary in the lineup this year well that was one of those real ugly ugly ones and boy look at him that's Just, a tough man I oh yeah. can only imagine or can't imagine the pain. He almost looks more disappointed that he's having to leave the field. And that is toughness right there. Taking his tape off. 
It's good to see him up though, and he'll be yeah. taken to the hospital and. One tough guy and it's always tough on the team too now at this point to try and get that out of their minds. I mean now Drew Tate starting with him he he you know didn't mean to but diving for extra yards kind of rolled up on the back of Dean and you know that he feels terrible right now but has to just let it go and get back out there and execute. This is the first half for Calgary so much momentum in this second half in the opening 10 minutes. See if they can continue it. Going up top, and that ball overthrown. Well covered, double coverage on Robbie Bryant. Lynn J. Shell had it bracketed with Sean Smalls. Yeah, that's one that I, I think Drew Tate was trying to look off coverage, and he took his eyes away from the play side, which was to Robbie Bryant. When he got back over there, he saw that double coverage with one of them being Lynn J. Shell, who already has an interception here tonight, and decided to throw it too far for any of them. Second and ten. Tate to the flat. Lewis to catch. And he is taken down quickly. Byron Parker off the corner with that short tackle. It gets congratulations from Nick Lewis. And that's a drive stopper for the Argos defense. Because Nick Lewis so many times has hurtled a tackler like that, run over a tackler like that. And he knows when he's up against a guy that is not going to just dive to the ground. Byron Parker's a big man uh, for a playing corner. He's out there at 220. So Paredes to attempt a 40 yarder. And Rene Paredes kneels that. As the Stampeders have 10 points here in this third quarter. Our sack tally tonight brought to you by Pure Later, tackling hunger across Canada. Check. That's what I talked about with the Let's Calgary Stampeders. Look at them right down at the bottom of the list and all the changes they've gone through, which I know Chris Jones will not use as an excuse at all because a lot of teams have gone through injuries. But after Charleston Hughes has seven sacks on the season, the Calgary Stampeders have really struggled up front. The D line giving up a, a bunch of rush yards this this game as well. Well, whatever was discussed in the Calgary locker room at halftime has had the right results so far. It's been a different team here in the second half under Drew Tate. Ten points for the Stampeders. Now within nine, but a lot of work to be done. In a critical game for the Stampeders. Paredes out of the scatter formation. And Chad Owens with the football for the Argos. And as Owens slowed up as he crossed the 35 yard line. And So Eric Fraser again, one of the first men to beat him. Uh, I've, I've seen we, a couple special teams tackles from Fraser. He's got 13 now on the season for the Calgary Stampeders. Doing a nice job on those cover teams. Let's see if Steven Giles now can go back to that two-back offense and see if he can stand, ground out some more rush yards. They do have a first down on the ground here in the second half. They don't have any passing yardage in the second half so far. Protection going to air it out. Looking downfield for Copeland and almost intercepted. Great facet was there. Demetrius Morley had a shot at the football and Jermaine Copeland looking for his first catch of the night. I'll tell you one thing, Stephen Giles has, has listened to the fans and he is trying to push the ball deep. This time he's going to go to his veteran and. Not a surprise with what happened on the last play. He tried to go deep to Brandon Rideau. But again, pretty good coverage down the field. It's going to have to be a spectacular catch from Jermaine Copeland, who has a chance at it. I think he just lost it once he tipped it the first time. Second and ten. Blitz off the edge. Giles underneath the boy. And Corey Boyd will 
extra momentum got him across the 45. Looks like he's going to be a couple yards short. So a two and out for the Argos, and the momentum stays with the Stampeders here in the third quarter. Yeah, and we haven't heard from Larry Taylor yet, really. I mean, it's been pretty good play by the Argo cover teams against him. Remember, he broke a big one in the BC game, really gave the Stampeders last week a chance to win that game, if not for McCallum on the last play. We haven't, he hasn't had his big return yet. Well, as mentioned, 270 return yards last week. The Argos have been great at covering kicks all season long. Another one bouncing, and Taylor nearly lost the handle. Steps out with Chad Cackert bearing down on him. Well, prior to kickoff, Carson Blackburn helped with the coin toss between the Stamps and the Argos here tonight as today's Scotiabank Kid Captain. For your child to be a Kid Captain, enter them at scotiakidcaptain.com. Pretty cool for those guys, man. They're looking up to some of their heroes. Even though he's got the Argo jersey on, he's going, hey, where, where, where are my guys? <laughs> oh, there they are. <laughs> and boy, are they big. <laughs> Stamps within nine on the first down of the 20. On a roll, look back, and now wide open Landon Talley. Taken down by Byron Parker, but up at the 45, the Stamps have another big pickup of 25 and a first down. And not only does Drew Tate have tremendous patience on this play, once he goes play action here, tremendous patience to get outside, but he also is going to look off the defender, look back into the middle, and then go back to Landon Talley down the sideline. Second consecutive start for Talley, replacing Kenyon Rambo, who's having Achilles problems. Three for 70 on the night. Cornish. Right there, John. And Cornish got outside and crosses the 50. Up about to the 52-yard line, he'll have seven more. And, you know, no matter what, I, we alluded to it about five, six minutes ago, Chris, but the way Drew Tate is playing right now and the way he is controlling this huddle, showing that poise and patience, it might be that interesting week in Calgary no matter how this game ends up from here on in. 10 for 15, 158, the touchdown. That's in less than a half of football. There's a good catch by Taylor his shoe tops to convert on second down and that was the first sort of off throw from Drew Tate since he's come in he kind of shook his head right away and knew it Larry Taylor bailed him out with a nice catch off the shoestrings but this is the first one that has not been right on the money Taylor with 15 catches on the year should be the final play of the third quarter It's driven back. Ichiro Kowali was there. So no gain, maybe a loss, but it's going to be an interesting fourth quarter at Rogers Center. Point Argo lead, but the stats tell you that Calgary's very much in this game. Yeah, certainly are. As soon as they made the, the change and brought Drew Tate in, it's been a different offense. Leading first downs, they lead in yardage, they lead in time of possession, and you just don't lead the football game, but there's lots of time to play. This is an eye-opening performance for Drew Tate, and it may be the most talked-about storyline in the CFL when this weekend's done. Interesting year, isn't it, when you think about what's happening in Hamilton with, you know, Kevin Glenn and now Quentin Porter possibly getting more playing time there. We'll see what happens this week and the rest of this game with Drew Tate and Henry Burris in Calgary. But, you know, it's that time of year where you just have to manufacture wins, and Guys have to put sort of their personal goals and things like that aside for the good of the team. So I think you're right, Chris. So no matter what the outcome here tonight, it's been an interesting week when they talk quarterbacks in Calgary. Second and 11, straight back, crosser for Arthur. Stood up, and Willie Pyle won't let him lean to the first down stick. He'll come up a couple of your yards short. And, you know, I mentioned those numbers for Tate were in about a half of football more accurately just over a quarter when he came in in the final minute or so of the first half i've loved his composure his accuracy on the throws his you know level of confidence where he's looking the secondary off 
and then on the run finding his targets and then his leadership abilities by really commanding that huddle you could see it I mean he, he's controlling things out there well, this is the second time a third down gamble here in the second half third and a yard and a half and Cornish has got it in a big way once again Calgary converts on third down and over a yard good decisions you remember back when Drew Tate threw it away he tried to scramble a little bit in that third quarter and then threw it out of bounds to save a loss and we could chalk that one up to what we've seen from number four for the Calgary Stampeder boy nice hole right side of that offensive line led by Demetrius Sumpas there swing it out to Taylor this time he can't make the catch that was not a lateral this time, and it's second and ten. Cornish comes out, and R.J. Franklin checks in as they'll... Looks like they'll go to a six-receiver package. Bryant, Lewis, Tally, Arthur... Franklin Taylor six receivers second and ten over the middle for Lewis and he's got it how he thread that needle wow well he threw Nick Lewis to move to the football I think he got it with one hand first of all but Lynn J. Shell was all over him, and Drew Tate put this ball where only Nick Lewis had a chance at it's going to be right over the middle jammed at the line or just 10 yards off the line from Lynn J. Shell. And as Nick Lewis fights through, that's the only place that football could be to give him a chance, and he got it. Now from our point, vantage point, it looked like there was any room there. Now looking into the corner for Forzani. Touchdown! Johnny Forzani on Byron Parker. And Byron Parker says that Johnny Forzani pushed off, and there might have been a little pushing and shoving going on both ways back in the corner of the end zone there no flag on the field the former NCAA dunk champion gets out jumped here by Johnny Forzani that's a good no call by the official and look at Forzani bring that one down right on the top of his shoulder pads well, we talked about a couple of games right for Forzani back in a big way and so are the Stamps. That's interference call from Johnny Forzani. Yeah, except for he's holding a water bottle. Full-size pickup on the road. Byron Parker was very upset and thought he should have drawn an offensive pass interference call from Johnny Forzani. Yeah, except for he's holding a water bottle, not a microphone, but that's okay. The 17 unanswered points here in the second half. And the Argos get some momentum back. Chad Owen stops short of the 30 yard line. That's a good play by Johnny Forzani. I like the I like the no call by the officials. They're having a good game, those officials, tonight. He does get his hands on the back of Byron Parker, but if you stop it there, okay, right there, both hands are on the back, but in order for this to be interference, Parker's got to lunge forward. He's got to actually take his a chance at the football away, and I don't see any push forward. He does ride him a little bit with his hands on the back of the jersey, but there was really no push forward. I think that's a good no call. Young receiver against a veteran DB. And the Calgary receiver won that battle. Now Corey Boyd to the outside, and he gets tripped up across the 40-yard line. That's Brandon Smith with the tackle, but a first down for the Argos. Chris, you mentioned unanswered points for the Calgary Stampeders, and, and there's the answer for Toronto. You're looking at it. First half, 173 yards rushing for the Toronto Argonauts, and the second, just 15. Have to put some first downs together, and... The Argonauts need to get some second half points. Run, run, run. 
Justin Phillips brings him down at the 43. That Calgary defense fired up. Robert McCune, part of it. In the first half alone, the Toronto Argonauts rushing the football had 173 yards, which is the most the Calgary Stampeders have given up all year in a game, let alone a first half. Boyd was doing most of the damage with over 100 yards rushing by himself in the first half. And in this second, the Argos come out with just 15 yards rushing. Just not attempting as many as they did in the first. Second down, they stay on the ground, and Boyd will be stopped short at the 47-yard line, had to get to the 50. So the Argos offense stalls once again on that four-yard pickup, and Calgary will get the ball. Two points down, but a possession with a chance to take the lead. Well, and just it just not a you know anything that would suggest that Drew Tate, I mean, he's just on a roll right now. Great boot, big boot, but sailing into the end zone. But the Argos might take that as a valuable point. Now a three-point lead. Our chance to salute our men and women of the Canadian Forces. Tonight we salute Engineer Sergeant Remy Goche, one of 65 Canadian Forces personnel currently deployed to Kingston, Jamaica on Operation Jaguar, an exercise that provides essential training for both Canadian and Jamaican search and rescue teams. Operation Jaguar is our most recent contribution to the professional development for the Jamaica Defense Force. So a special hello to Sergeant Remy Goche and an interesting decision here on the field. Yes, we said it might be a big point. It was so big, Calgary did not concede it. There was a no yards penalty and the Stampeders took the penalty from the ball at the 15. It remains a two point game. Jabari Arthur. With a catch up to the 23, you often see that penalty automatically decline for field position. Yeah, you know, with 10 minutes left, and it was when when that decision was made, I still that's pretty early to start thinking about that single affecting, you know, the outcome for John Hoffnagel. However, with the play of Drew Tate right now and the confidence that he's playing with, I think he's had success on almost every drive he's been on the field. Yeah, but he's, he's dug themselves over out of a bigger hole than that. And here's that tight end formation. This time Tate gets cut down very quickly. And are they going to have a third and over yard decision to make again? And this one will be from inside the 25 yard line. John Huffnagel's right there. <laughs> yep, he's going to earn his money with this one. This is a tough call, and the punt team's going to come on. Yes, they are. He, he went down and looked at it himself. I mean, he didn't want to rely on anything else. And he walked right down to that line of scrimmage, took a look, and, and quickly decided to go ahead and kick the football. It's a yard and a half at least, and although they've converted with authority, that's, that's in a dangerous area. Now, now they kick it back to Toronto, depending on this return from Chad Owens. You go back to that decision. Maybe that single point would have been worth conceding. Burke Dales lets it fly. Owens at his 41. Trying to get outside, gets the block. And now cut it back. Anybody? That was an interesting return as he bounced around for 15, and the Argos have great field position at midfield. The NFL on TSN continues on Sunday when the Minnesota Vikings travel to Chicago to take on the Bears Sunday night football live coverage, 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific on TSN. You can also watch the game live on TSN Mobile TV. Adrian Peterson was off and running last Sunday. The Argos have had nothing going in the second half. You know, whether he gets a, a long return for a touchdown or, or he gets 10 or 15 yards, this guy's an exciting player to watch, man. Shooter bugged his way to close to midfield. Boy, boy. They've 
shut her down a little bit in the second half. Devon Claybrooks on the inside and holds Boyd to short yardage there, two to three yards. That's what they're they're better at in the second half. Chris Jones got him going, on, and and you could see the the enthusiasm from Devon Claybrooks there in the middle. That's where they they've been better in this half is is the interior in the middle. And they're, what they're saying now is that if, if they're going to have success running, the Argos are going to have to have Stephen Giles pull it and get him out on the edge. They, I think Calgary would rather see Giles run it than Boyd. It's been a while since we saw Giles run it. He's throwing it this time. Copeland can't catch it. Eric Fraser does. It's another turnover. The Calgary Stampeders have another interception. Fraser's got his second of the season. Since the Stampeders had one interception in their last six games, they've got three tonight. Well, Eric Fraser's got the interception, Chris, but it was Greg Facet in coverage that causes it. He just stuck with it, glued right to Jermaine Cop Copeland, and when that ball was thrown a little bit high, got the left hand in there, tipped it up to his teammate Eric Fraser. So Giles has thrown three for the second time this year through three against Winnipeg. First time the Stampeders have nabbed three in a game. Take over at the 51. Routine faked a little shovel, gets it to Coker, and Coker take it down quickly. Good tackle by Jordan Younger. Check that Byron Parker with the stop. Yeah, I think he, Byron Parker's upset. He's yeah. upset after that Johnny Forzani push. He thought he was pushed in the back by Forzani. It should have been a pass interference call on his touchdown. And since then, he's made two big tackles like this. One on Nick Lewis and one on LaMarcus Coker right there. And uh, Stan Peter has gone down. And LaMarcus Coker cramping up here, it would appear. Take a look at what happened to Coker. Coming off the field and cramping up. It looks like he, well, he grabbed the ankle. But the reaction down the, yeah, there's the pain in the ankle. And, and again, that's why you see he was making it off the field. And as Coker's coming off the field, the entire team is telling him, just go down, because if you come off, now we want to make sure we get the right personnel, depending on what grouping's out there. And the sideline will then try and organize and regroup and make sure they got everybody. That buys them some time. The only downside is that Coker now, no matter what, has to stay out for three plays, even if he's okay. The CFL on TSN is brought to you by Wendy's Baconator, the official hamburger of the Canadian Football League. We're in for a good finish tonight. Clock running, just over six and a half to go. And a big play coming up with Calgary looking at second and seven. Down by a pair. In front of Sean Smalls. Rami Bryant was left by himself on the backside because Jabari Arthur came in to help block. And when he comes in to block here, then he gets the one-on-one -on, -one on the outside. And Drew Tate, again, puts it right on the money for Rami Bryant. Lin Jay Shell was coming on a blitz, mistimed his jump, so he was down on the ground when Drew Tate let go of that one. Shell intended for Jabari Arthur. Yeah, that was uh, again that matchup again. That when when on that last play, Jabari Arthur went to block. Lin J. Shell started to blitz. This time you go here and Lin J. Shell, who's playing another good game, he anticipates this nicely and jumps his curl. He didn't even move in his back pedal. And if he doesn't miss time his jump on that first down throw, that one gets knocked down. And the stamps convert. Second and ten. Four receivers wide side. Tate steps up and takes off. First down, and he hits the deck inside the 25-yard line.
side. Kevin Huntley jumping in frustration because Tate ran by him. Yeah, Kevin Huntley had a chance, Adam. Remember when I talked about Willie Pyle kept coming down to the line of scrimmage, leaving the middle open, and when would it be a time for Calgary to go ahead and try and take advantage of that? Well, Drew Tate wanted to. He had Landon Talley going down the seam, but Huntley gets there on that spin move and then just misses him here. Six run for 36 yards for Tate. In field goal range, poised to take the lead, but they want more. R.J. Franklin, and that's incomplete. A long road back for R.J. Franklin. Last catch from him was back in July 14th against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, and he's been injured, just came back in the roster last week and trying to work himself back into game shape. And the man who took his job has a big touchdown tonight, Johnny Forzani. This is at least the third time it's been second and long. On this drive is Tate Audibles. Really piles down low again. Here they come. He steps up, takes off, and he'll be close to another first down. Looks like he might be a half yard short. Boy, you can tell Drew Tate wants it. He's trying to get there now. This time it looks like there might have been a bit of a rotation, but every time now Drew Tate sees number 10 down at the line of scrimmage, he wants to go to the hole. Now that pocket's collapsing because you can see all the pressure coming, but if he can get that one out of there, they make a big play down the middle. So far, he's had to run on both those opportunities. I'll give John Hupnagel credit for good game management as his decision earlier means this field goal attempt by Rennie Paradez is for the lead and not for the tie. It helped to get the Eric Fraser interception, though. Yes, it did in that process, but you're right. You've got to give him credit. 29-28. The Calgary Stampeders have the lead for the first time since Paradez opened the scoring. With a short field goal in the opening quarter, but Drew Tate has changed the complexion of this night. You know, every every player needs that sort of play or that quarter or even even that game where it sort of is your signature moment, your moment where you say to the coaches, you know, I'm ready. Drew Tate looks ready to me. Third year out of Iowa, and he has rallied this team with 20 unanswered points. Down 28-9. And it looked like this one had gotten away from the Stampeders, but Drew Tate making a name for himself tonight and keeping the Stamps very much in this race for first in the CFL West. It's such a significant game, you consider that the loss tonight might end any hopes realistically of having a bye in first place. Yeah, I think you're right. And considering the season series between Calgary, BC, and Calgary, Edmonton, they have to keep winning. They have a chance for first. Chad Owens. That's our first contact, and he is away. Cross midfield. And Antway will bring him down, but not before he gets to the 45, close to Prefontaine. Field goal range the other way. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna correct myself. I stand corrected. The big runs are, are more exciting than the 10-yard runs, <laughs> even though those can be fun to watch with Chad Owens as well. I mean I, you just what what is completely sh not shocking, but just you marvel at, I guess, is the best way to put it, is that it looks like there's no way that Chad Owens should get out of that group of Calgary jerseys. I mean, he was surrounded by four or five. Somehow, those quick feet of his, he bounces and gets out there, and he's that much closer to that 3,000 mark. 55 yards on the return. Corey Boyd, not much there. Taken down immediately by Torrey Davis. And do they play close to the vest and make sure they come away with three? Or does Stephen Giles throw on second and long? Well, to give Prefontaine a, a, you know, a real good chance at that, they're going to need to get this first down at least. So, passing down. Prefontaine's longest is 48. 
If they tried right now, this would be from 51. Giles, flag. Well, that might knock them out of field goal range unless there's an interception. And do they have they one? That. Jeff Tisdale's got it. They are ruling interception. Jeff Tisdale has the pick. It would be the fourth of the night for Calgary. The flag in that usual holding area against Toronto. Let's wait as the officials conference. And we probably would get a challenge regardless of what the call is here. Take a look, top right-hand corner of your screen. Again, Brandon Rideau up on that sideline. The ruling on the field is that is an interception by Calgary. Also, there had been a hold, Toronto number 62. That penalty will be declined. So the ruling at this point is first down, Calgary. There goes the challenge oh flag as Al Bradbury finished. And now you see Stephen Giles real upset with Brandon Rideau. And, I, you know, I don't blame him. Right? We've seen three or four examples tonight. And Brandon Rideau has got to want that football coming back like that. I mean, he, the, the Argos were going to get the holding call. And that was going to push them out of field goal range and probably, you know, depending Toronto on... Toronto is challenging the ruling on the field of an interception. Now this is interesting. It, yeah. There's under three minutes to go. The Argos challenge flag does come out, but technically this has to be Elite from challenge. upstairs, and, and they will challenge it anyway. So, And you don't know what would have happened on second and long and a holding call and all of those things, but it looks like to me that... Well, does the ball Yeah, you lose it at the shoulder. end. Does it, just, does it just lie on the top of them or not? We may need another angle. Okay, from that first look, it looked like the ball was on his chest the whole time, but it wasn't. No, uh, I think that might have been on the ground. It might have been on the ground, but this this will tell us. And does it ever hit the ground, or does it sit up on Brandon Bordeaux's arm, which would add insult to injury? It's hard to tell the ball in between them. And well, here's the hard thing. to believe it didn't hit the ground, but. Do they have anything conclusive here? That's the bottom line. I, I think Calgary fans watching those replays that we've all seen, and that's exactly what Mission Control will see. And is there ever any evidence at all there to, to show that the ball touched the, the turf? I don't think there's evidence, not from the angles we've seen. And the call on the play, the call on the play was interception Calgary. The boys in the truck magnifying this to try and give you a better look and a definitive call but Rideau kind of blocks the view here and it's at that point he pulls it back was it on the ground or was it on the shoulder on the shoulder I don't see from what I've seen so far any evidence to suggest that the call in the field is the wrong call <laughs> Patience of virtue, Mr. Tisdale. Who likes to play against Toronto all of a sudden. Uh, an old Tiger Cat. Yeah, good point. Would be his second of the game. So it's, so you're saying it's in the DNA. Yeah, it <laughs> never goes away, does it? One more look maybe from this angle. You can see something other than what we have heard from the officials. Ball popped away from him there, again behind Bradwell, but where did it go after that? As the Argos squander the brilliant return by Owens, one way or another. I, You know, I, again, I, that's yet another angle. And just as Bradwell, just as we need the evidence, Bradwell blocks the shot. <laughs> the Zapruder film. The ruling on the field stands. It is an interception. Ah, yeah, exactly. The three minute warning has been given. So Tisdale has two. Calgary has four. And we'll be back with the final three after this. Our game story brought to you by Mr. Lube. 
Corey Boyd with a big first half 173 yards rushing for the Toronto Argonauts in the first half but you see that bottom one for Toronto Stephen Giles and what a difference maker Drew Tate has been for this offense and our thanks to Tom Higgins for checking in with us to confirm that because the three minute warning hadn't been given the Argos did have to use the challenge one way or the other that one was going to be looked at and no conclusive evidence so Calgary's got the ball swung out and there's an incompletion as Landon Talley snuck a peek and now Calgary facing a key second and ten as the Argos look to get it back with a lot of time still on the clock. You know, this is a small thing, but you see the reaction from Drew Tate after that compared to the reaction of Drew Tate when his receivers didn't come back and he had to throw it away. Very different reaction there. That was just a, a physical mistake by his receiver, and he didn't make a big deal of it. It went back and called the next play. I, that's the poise of a veteran there and how to handle that situation. Second and ten. be a first down for Calgary what a key conversion that is for Drew Tate and had to get outside and, and knew that, that that imaginary clock that's ticking in a quarterback's head was starting to wind down and he had big Kevin Huntley coming down hard on him and he hustles down to go say hey, great catch to his receiver there but he does get to the 44 the Toronto Argonauts have had fourth quarter nightmares this year no points tonight they've been outscored 132 to 64 in the fourth quarter of games led at the end of the first quarter nine times this year they've had the leader been tied after one quarter but it's gotten away from them in the second half a lot this year Jim Barker's team trying to Put the brakes on this, getting away from them again. Second and six. Quick hit. Oh, Argos will get it back. You know, uh, when, you, when you're talking about that, first of all, give credit to Drew Tate for coming in and do, doing what he's done with Calgary's offense. But I would look at the Toronto Argonauts and their sideline after 173 in the first rushing and real control of the game. Jimmy Elizondo and Jim Barker went away from Corey Boyd in the third quarter. Went back to it in the fourth, but by then, the Calgary Stampeders had climbed back into it, and they had figured out how to try and stop that run better in the interior of the defensive line. Third down, the number one punt returner in the CFL awaits. Burton deals with the angle kick. Oh, that! If Eric Fraser doesn't make that one, you're calling an Owens touchdown, partner. He had the wall. He had blockers out in front of him, and the only guy that could get him was Eric Fraser, who has an interception on the night. Now he bounces there. Stop it there. He has two guys out in front of him, and the tire sideline. That's the one guy that can get him for the Calgary Stampeders, and Eric Fraser pulls it off. That's his third special teams tackle that we've counted. Minute 26 on the clock, and they need at least 40 yards. Big to Boyd to the outside. Spencer Rapp is tossed down. Brandon Smith wants the tipper, got the tackle. There goes arguing there was a face mask on the plate. Yeah, but that's no time to be doing that. Just get back in the huddle. The clock is your enemy now if you're the Toronto Argonauts and you have to get this ball down the field. See what? There's no question the face no mask is gone. What might have been better to just keep going to the sidelines there. Second down, and boy, will get a first down for Toronto. Have you seen, let me ask you this, have you seen enough from Stephen Giles tonight in his sixth start now for the Toronto Argonauts? We're going to need a full game to make that assessment you because are. he can change everybody's mind on this drive. And he's going to try to do a throw. The door is slowed up, and it's incomplete. 
hard to make an assessment on a guy that really missed all of camp the first nine weeks and has been designated the Argo quarterback of the future by Jim Barker. But you're right, the jury's out on a guy who's 3-13 and 13 coming into the game. And that rust you're talking about, you know, game one, game two, let's even push it to game three. This is game six now. Second and ten. Draw Boyd. Corey Boyd lunging up to the 42, but he's going to leave the Argos well short here. And the offense has got to come up with something on third down and five. I'm not saying Giles isn't. You know, and I, I certainly, when you watch him athletically, you can see why coaches get pretty fired up about watching him athletically, and certainly Jim Barker's talked highly about it. This is a big play, obviously. To stay alive. And time. Now running out of it. In trouble for Boyd. The catch is made, but Corey Boyd is short. On the first down, in fact, right at the line of scrimmage, he's hauled down. And it's a turnover on downs, but there is a flag down. And who's it against? Way over by the Argonaut sideline. Looks like the Argos are getting a reprieve. Illegal contact on a receiver. Calvary, number 28. Wow. First down. They stay alive. Brandon Smith called. Brandon Smith had a quiet night. A guy that I mentioned off the top is a is a guy that has uh, got to be one of the candidates as the outstanding defensive player nominee out of the Calgary Stampeders. But see illegal contact there, way away from the play. Giles, there goes, held up again, and this is picked up. But there is a flag, and it looked like that time. Brandon Rodeau was was grabbed on the play. Was it Jeff Tisdale? This has been an area that I think John Hoffnagel thought was behind them when you think of the Calgary Stampeders and pass interference or illegal contact. Last two games, they haven't had a pass interference call, although they've had 18 on the season coming in tonight. Illegal contact on a receiver. Calgary, number 29. 10-yard penalty, first down. What a great exchange. Tisdale looked at the bench and claimed innocence, and John Hoffnagel said, no, you grabbed him. And the penalty... Gets it down close to field goal range. Yeah, and you know what? No matter what Jeff Tisdale says right now, tomorrow this time, everyone will know, it was a grab that slowed down Brandon Rideau down that sideline. <laughs> At the 48, it's a first down. Boyd trying to get it in the field goal range. And Corey Boyd pushes the pile now down to the 41. So they've got it to where Prefontaine can hit it. Now that that play made that pass interference or legal contact made because Giles gave him a chance threw the ball deep. Second and two, two and a half. Giles takes off. Got a first down. And a feet first slide at the 25. Fifteen yard run and Stephen Giles with the help of some penalties here. In the final minute, have the Argos poised to salvage the night? John Hopnagel's going to call his timeout. Timeout, Calgary. Well, a couple of times in this game, the Argos have been in field goal range and shot themselves in the foot. This will take you back to that first Brandon Smith. I know Calgary fans wanted to see that illegal contact at the top. He was playing in the slot here. That jam's okay, but then he pulls the jersey, pulls the receiver closer to him. That was the first one. Jeff Tisdale at the top of your screen. He's going to get the second one. The reason this penalty happened, if the ball's not in the air right there, there's no penalty. They let that go. But because the ball was in the air, when he made that little grab on Brandon Rideau and turned his shoulder, that drew the flag. And both penalties negated turnovers. One, a turnover on downs. The other, the Moley interception. And now the Argos just have to set it up into the middle of the field. For Prefontaine, Boyd got a little scrap going. And that's one thing the Argos can't do is take a penalty down here. 
And Spencer Watt was tackled by Jeff Tisdale. Had the helmet ripped off and thought there was a flag down. And it is, and it's going against Calgary. Major foul. Horse collar tackle. Calgary number 12. First down. Let's get Jawan Simpson on the tackle. And John Hefnagel can't bear to look now. After all the offense is done to put them in the lead, to have it slip away here with a penalty parade on the final drive of the night. Going to run some time off here for Prefontaine, and now it will be just a little longer than a convert. We will remind you that he had a convert deflected off a hand that just lined in tonight. So they still have to execute the final play of the night. Prefontaine setting up. At about the 18-yard line. They'll wind the clock down. Noel Prefontaine for the win. We got it. And the Argos will escape. An upset win. They do it the hardest. And a devastating loss for the Calgary St. Peters. Tremendous effort in the losing cause for Drew Tate as he came in in relief and really rallied the Calgary St. Peters. But hey, full credit to this Argo team with nothing to play for in the standings. A good first half with a good offense along the ground. Hung in there in the second half and then got the one drive they needed to put Prefontaine in position to win the game. Fourth win for the Argos. Two against Calgary. Who's your gladiator tonight? Well, honorable mention to Chris Van Zyl, who had a good game at that right tackle, but because it was a record-tying interception from Byron Parker, because he played well on defense, especially in this second half, against the run, coming up and making some big hits, not only on a powerful runner in Nick Lewis, but out of the running back position, too, in LaMarcus Coker. We're going to give our gladiator tonight to corner Byron Parker. Canadian Football League record tire tonight with his eighth career interception return for a touchdown. Drew Tate off the bench with 20 straight points, but then the Argos in the final minute on three Calgary penalties drive into field goal range, and Prefontaine gets it done. Calgary drops to eight and seven. It's a shocker. 31-29 the final for the Argos. Sports Center's next. So long from Rogers Center.